So we are going to talk about when you can cancel numbers on both sides of a congruence. So if we have some constant a on both sides of our congruence, so ax is congruent to ay mod n, can we say that x is congruent to y mod n? Well, let's look at an example. We know that 4 is congruent to 10 mod 6. Notice that the numbers on both sides of this congruence are even, which means they contain a factor of 2. We can write this as 4 being 2 times 2 and 10 being 2 times 5 mod 6. So the question is, if we have this factor of 2 on both sides, can we cancel that out? Well, let's see what we would get if we did. In that case, we would get just 1, 2 on the left side being congruent to 5 mod 6. Now we know that our original congruence up here was true. These two numbers are congruent mod 6. But down here, 2 is definitely not congruent to 5 because if we divide 2 by 6, the remainder is 2. And if we divide 5 by 6, the remainder is 5. So those are definitely not the same remainder. Which means that this rule doesn't work all the time. However, there are some cases where we're able to do this cancellation. And the condition for being able to do this is that the greatest common divisor of a and n must be equal to 1. In other words, a and n must be relatively prime. They share no prime factors. So let's see why that's true. We're starting with the congruence on the left here. By the definition of congruence mod n, if ax is congruent to ay mod n, then we know the difference, ax minus ay, must be a multiple of n. Now on the left side, we can factor out the shared factor of a. So we have a times x minus y equals some integer k times n. Now let's think about what would be necessary for this equation to be true. Remember that a and n are relatively prime, which means that they don't share any prime factors. We know that n is going to have some prime factors. And we also know that a will not have any of those prime factors because the greatest common divisor of a and n equals 1. There's no number that divides both a and n except for 1. What that means is that for this equation to be true, x minus y needs to have all of the prime factors of n because we know that both of these products need to have the same prime factors for them to be equal, but a doesn't have any of the prime factors of n. So for this expression on the left to include all of the prime factors of n, x minus y needs to have all of those factors. And if x minus y has to include all of the prime factors of n, then we know x minus y must be some multiple of n. Because if it includes all of the prime factors of n, we know that all of the prime factors of n, if we multiply them together, will give us n. So this difference, x minus y, has to at least include a factor of n in order for this equation to be true. So we've derived that because a doesn't have any of the prime factors of n, x minus y needs to have those prime factors for this equation to be true. And therefore, x minus y is a multiple of n. But if x minus y is a multiple of n, that's the definition of congruence mod n. So from this equation, we can conclude x is congruent to y mod n because the difference, x minus y, is a multiple of n, and that's the definition of congruence mod n. Remember that the reason that this cancellation worked is specifically because a had no prime factors of n, and therefore x needed to have all of them. One of the consequences of this cancellation rule is that if a is relatively prime to n, then multiplying by the constant a is injective. Now I have another video on what it means for a function to be injective, so you can check that link in the description if you aren't familiar with that idea. The definition of an injective function is that for that function f, if f of x1 equals f of x2, then we must have x1 equal to x2. 
And this cancellation rule that we just derived is almost identical to the statement that is the definition of an injective function. So if we think about the function that goes from x mod n to ax mod n, this function is injective. If we get the same output for two different numbers, x and y, then those numbers, x and y, need to be congruent mod n. And that's an important property that we'll use in proofs of some identities in modular arithmetic, such as for Ma's Little Theorem. So now we're going to look at one more cancellation rule in modular arithmetic. And this time, instead of looking at a shared factor just between x and y, we're going to look at a shared factor across all three of the numbers in this congruence. So if dx is congruent to dy mod dn, then we know x is congruent to y mod n. And this proof is actually very simple. We're just going to use the definition of modular arithmetic. If dx is congruent to dy, then we know that the difference dx minus dy has to be a multiple of this number here. So let's say the multiple is k, then dx minus dy is equal to k times dn. But from here, notice that d is not equal to 0, otherwise this congruence doesn't make any sense. If d is not equal to 0, this is an ordinary equation, so we can divide everything by the number d. And if we do that, on the left side we'll get x minus y, and on the right side if we divide by d, we're just going to have k times n. So immediately from this first equation, we've derived this second equation here. And this equation is the definition of the congruence x is congruent to y mod n. The difference x minus y is a multiple of n. And notice that this is actually a biconditional. What that means is we just proved that starting with dx is congruent to dy mod dn, we can get to this second statement. But we can also go the other way around. If x is congruent to y mod n, we know that the difference x minus y is a multiple of n. We can multiply this equation by the number d. And if we do that, we'll immediately get from our first congruence that dx minus dy equals k times dn. And therefore, we've derived this statement. So these two congruences are exactly equivalent. And that's the second cancellation rule. So let's do some practice problems looking at canceling out shared factors in a modular congruence. The first problem is what do we do if we have the congruence 5 is congruent to 35 mod 6? Notice in this case both of these numbers share the factor of 5. So we can rewrite this as 5 times 1 is congruent to 5 times 7 mod 6. Now we want to try to cancel out the 5. Are we able to do that? We are, and the reason is 5 is relatively prime to 6. So because 5 and 6 share no common factors, we know that we can use that first cancellation rule, which is that we can cancel out relatively prime factors. And therefore we get 1 is congruent to 7 mod 6. So we started with a congruence that is true, in this case, when we divide 5 by 6, the remainder is 5. And when we divide 35 by 6, the remainder is also 5. And this statement down here is also true. If we divide 1 by 6, we get 1. And if we divide 7 by 6, we also get 1. Therefore, we're able to cancel out that prime factor. Next example is the example that we saw at the beginning of the video. 4 is congruent to 10 mod 6. Now we saw that it's not possible to cancel out the factor of 2 just from the 4 and the 10 here. So if we write this as 2 times 2 is congruent to 2 times 5, we can't immediately just take out the 2 and say 2 is congruent to 5. But there's another rule that we can use, which is the second rule that we just derived. We know that 6 is equal to 2 times 3. And from that, notice there's a shared factor of 2, not only in these two terms, but also in the modulus itself. So it's of the form that we see right here, and that means we can cancel out the 2 from everything. And that leaves us with 2 is congruent to 5 mod 3. 
and we see that this statement actually is true because when we divide five by three, the remainder is two. So these are our two cancellation rules that we can use when we're doing modular arithmetic. I'll also point out for anyone who is wondering, this first cancellation rule with the relatively prime factors is also a biconditional just because we know that in modular arithmetic, you can multiply both sides by a constant factor and that won't change the result. So that proves the statement going to the left. Now from these two statements, we can actually derive a more general statement, which is that if we have ax congruent to ay mod n, regardless of whether a and n are relatively prime, we can prove that this implies x is congruent to y mod n over the GCD of a and n. So this rule is much more general in that it doesn't require anything about shared factors with the number n. So we can always cancel out any factor a as long as we divide by the greatest common divisor here. Now I won't go through the entire proof of this cancellation rule, but the idea is that we apply two different steps. In the first step, we look at the greatest common divisor of a and n. And because that greatest common divisor has to be a factor of n, we can cancel it out just like we see on the top here, and that's what changes the modulus. Once we've taken out that greatest common divisor, n over the GCD of a and n has to be relatively prime to whatever is left here with a, and therefore we can apply the second cancellation rule to just get x is congruent to y. And that's how we cancel out shared factors when we're doing modular arithmetic.